He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. Amen. That is what we are here to do today. Church, we want to welcome you to North Lake Baptist Church. Guest, thank you for coming and joining us and exalting our Savior with us this morning. We are so honored to have you uh, with us this morning. Our ushers are located here at the end of the aisle, and they have a gift bag for you. So if you would kindly raise your hand, we'd love to give you that gift bag. Uh, there's a little coffee mug in there and a brochure about us and a little visitor's card uh, that we'd love for you to fill out and uh, just place in the offering plate so we can get to know a little bit more about you and and maybe give you a phone call this week to get to know about you and say thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, ushers and guests, uh, for being with us this morning. Church, let's open up our bulletins and look at our announcements this week. Looks like a uh, pretty normal week for us uh, this week. Uh, our Trail Life and American Heritage Girls uh, will be meeting this afternoon along with choir at 5 o'clock. Uh, also, uh, Children Tomorrow Traveling Day Camp starts for you. And I know you're excited about that, as am I. And so uh, our kids will be off uh, on day trips uh, Monday through Thursday this week. So be praying for us as we uh, enjoy that time together. Uh, Wednesday night, our uh, regular Bible studies will be occurring with Summer Kids Series, Adult and Youth Bible Study. And I think that would wrap up our week. Some other announcements. Uh, look there, Awana is uh, coming up. And so you can see uh, August 25th, uh, Awana workers meeting. And September 1st is registration, parent meeting, games, and ice cream. So that means we're getting close to school starting, boys and girls. So I hope you are ready. Uh, also, that means our church year uh, is about to come to a close, and so that means a new church year is beginning, and so we're working on our budget, and so if you are responsible for a line in our budget, if you have any budget requests, please get those to Katie in the church office so our stewardship team uh, can be busy about uh, putting together the church's budget. I also want to remind you about that public affairs ministry training at uh, Troop McConnell University on August 23rd. Uh, be sure to uh, check that out uh, if you are interested in knowing how you can engage our government in the policy making and serve our governmental leaders. All right, so that concludes our announcements. Church, um, I love... 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because I was a royal ambassador, and part of being an RA was knowing that you are an ambassador for Christ. And Paul reminds us there in verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Church, will you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. Lord, may our worship today, may it be a pleading to be reconciled to you. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus to take our sins upon himself and to die upon Calvary's cross that we might be imputed with the righteousness of God through Jesus' death on the cross. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It is good to have you with us. I add my words of welcome to you this morning. Glad that you have uh, joined us, whether you're online or with us this morning in the building. I want to remind folks this morning that we serve a mighty, mighty God, and I don't know how many of you realize that, but I hope each and every one of you have encountered and had an experience this morning with our mighty, mighty God as you were preparing or you got here in Sunday school and you worshiped uh, our Lord. But sometimes we don't quite understand how God works. And I'm not questioning uh, God at all, but I am questioning sometimes 
Lord, I don't understand why I went through this particular circumstance. Why am I going through this today? What is this trial? What are you, what are you trying to show me? And through, uh, through my experiences, the one question I always ask the Lord is, not necessarily why, but Lord, what are you trying to teach me through the experiences that I'm going through? So it may not be that we understand exactly, but if we trust in the Lord and understand who He is, we can better trust regardless of the circumstance that comes our way. So this morning, let's stand together, and I want us to sing about those uh, opportunities that the Lord gives us to understand and know Him more. So let's sing and worship Him this morning. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But He guides us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will of how God has helped us through our circumstances this morning. Many of us, as we go through those, again, like I said, we question, Lord, what are we trying to learn through that? But I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11, that regardless of what happens, God should be our sure foundation. It says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that was already laid, which is in Christ Jesus. And this morning, He has laid that foundation for us by going to the cross on our behalf. And because of that, He is our sure foundation. You know, there's, there's a parable that Christ tells about the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And it doesn't matter what happens. The rain can come down. The streams can rise and flood. The winds can blow against that house that was built, but it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But then you have someone who built the foolish man, as Scripture says, who built his house upon the sand. The rains came down, the floods came, the streams rose, the winds blew, and his house did not prevail. His house did not stand. It ended up falling with a great crash. So this morning I want to ask you, where is your foundation? Where is your house built? Is it laid in the foundation of Christ? And if not, I want to challenge you today to reaffirm that relation with Him as Christ, our solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love.
Hebrews chapter 6 says this, Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that two unchangeable things in which is it impossible for God to lie we who have fled take hold of the hope that is offered to us so that we may be greatly encouraged. For we have this hope as an anchor for the soul which is firm and secure. As we've just sung about that anchor, that solid rock, sometimes God wants us to hold firm and fast, but he also wants us to be still at the same time, which is difficult for some of us. Some of us like to move ahead and forge ahead when God wants us to be still in a moment and focus on him and listen to him and what he's trying to tell us. So as part of that being firm in Christ, sometimes we need to be still as well. Oh, 
So welcome you to the house of the Lord today. So good to see you here. If you have your bulletins, let's look at the back page at our prayer list. Our prayer verse today comes from Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Let's not forget that last part. When the Lord does answer our prayers, then let's praise him for it and glorify him. Begin today with some praises. We've got Kelly Smith, who's spent a long time in the hospital so far this year. And uh, she's uh, back home from the hospital. We praise the Lord for that. Also, we had a uh, new baby in our church family. Uh, Melissa and Caesar Molina had a little baby girl on Thursday, Amelia Grace, uh, eight pound, three ounce, and 19 and a half inches tall. So we praise the Lord for uh, new birth. Um, also, Miss Mildred Boykin, I think she's in the house. There she is. She's 91 years young as of Friday. So we praise the Lord for her uh, birthday. I want to pray for those in our circle of influence who the Lord may be using us in order to lead them to faith in Christ. So uh, pray that prayer and then ask the Lord to show you how to lead them to faith. I want to pray for those you see listed in our church family and our parents who are expecting uh, children, uh, extended family and friends. Uh, folks have asked us to remember uh, their relatives uh, on our prayer list. Long-term care, you see the last line. We have Alan Warner there who had carotid surgery this past Thursday. Also, I want to remember our missionaries serving around the world. Today, the uh, International Mission Board has notified us of an unreached people group in southern India. Uh, some 400,000 folks called Maranaires uh, never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing in our world with all the electronics and things we've got going? There's still people in the world who've never heard of Jesus. So pray for our missionaries as they come up with strategies in order to reach these uh, unreached people groups. We want to pray for our nation that the Lord might revive us again. We also want to remember our families who are struggling with grief, the family and friends of Sharon Smith, that's Patricia Bookmiller's sister-in-law and Andrew's aunt. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with, a beautiful day outside for your people uh, to come to this place and worship you, the true and living God. We also thank you, Lord, for those who are able to watch online, and we pray, Lord, that you continue to bless them as they offer their prayers before you even now as well. Lord, we have a long prayer list, but we know you're fully capable of answering all these prayers according to your will and purpose, 
And so, Lord, that's why we offer them before you. We pray today if there's someone here that does not yet know Christ as their Savior, that today is the day that they would be saved. And, Lord, we do thank you that you are our rock and you help us through all the trials, troubles, temptations that we face in life. And, Lord, we thank you that we have the assurance of that from your word, which we'll be studying shortly. Lord, bless us today as we continue to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, choir, the God of angel armies, known in King James as the Lord of hosts, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad to know that he's always by your side when we go through the temptations, troubles, and trials we face? If you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew chapter 6 again. I read this same passage about six weeks in a row now. I hope you don't find it monotonous because you actually ought to be reading this passage every day. Not to just quote it, but to use it as a meditation when you have your prayer time, when you have your quiet time. Just go through, take each phrase, break it down, and then uh, apply that to the life situations that you're facing and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, as the Lord taught us to pray. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all the people said, amen. amen. And we continue on the gospel of Matthew. We continue on our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And then we've been studying... Um, very closely the Lord's model prayer that he gave for us. Last week we talked about forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses. This week we're going to look at lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And these two verses are related because in honest confession of our past sin, uh, we should be realizing our weaknesses and ask the Lord to help us uh, to overcome future sins. Uh, by praying that last part there, lead us not into temptation. You know, it's kind of like uh, football coaches. After a game, particularly a game that they lost, they review those game films and they slow them down, put them in slow motion, and they ask the question, where did we go wrong? And the same should be true with us. We should review our failures. We should go through our temptations, our faults, our failures, and our sins and as we review our past failures, uh, we'll find that temptation is where the sin cycle begins. And you may say, well, Danny, if uh, temptation is where sin begins, why not just nip it in the bud? You know, as Barney Fife used to say, that was his answer to everything. If that's where the trouble is, why not just nip it? And why not just say no to temptation? Well, the problem is, Revelation, I mean, Romans chapter 7 tells us it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's a little bit more complicated than just say no. Uh, we're told in Romans chapter 7 that we have this thing called a sin nature. In the New Testament, depending on your translation, it may call it a carnal nature. It may call it the flesh. But Romans 7, 14, I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will or what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I end up doing. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my sinful nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. And this is why believers need to pray and ask God to help us in our temptations. Those times when our sinful nature is saying, just do it, and the times that our spiritual nature is at the same time saying, don't do it. Uh, we need to pause and pray and ask God to give us the strength in order to do the right thing. So what does the Bible teach us about these temptations, these tests, these trials that we go through? Well, the first thing uh, that I've learned in my studies is that temptation begins with our own lusts and desires. James 1.14 says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, desires are actually a normal part of our physical life. Uh, it's normal for us to hunger. Uh, some of you are going to be doing that in less than an hour here. You're ready to, ready to go to lunch here. It's, it's normal to have hunger and thirst and a desire for comfort and for rest and sex drive and all that. All those are a normal part of having a human body. And if they're properly controlled, then it will keep you healthy, happy, and continue the species. Uh, but to, So it ought to be relatively easy. Problem solved. All we need to do is just practice some simple self-control. But the problem is it's not simple. See, we're born into a sin-cursed, Satan-influenced world, and the deck is stacked against us. 
1 John chapter 2 and verse 16 says, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And that's why God commands us in the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet, you shall not lust, you shall not give in to selfish or evil desires, because when we begin to live by our lusts or by our desires, then we'll soon find ourselves sinning against God and destroying ourselves. I'll give you a couple examples to work through that with. For example, our first mother, Eve. We're told about her in Genesis chapter 3 uh, in her little escapade there with the forbidden fruit. Uh, the Bible says that when she looked at it, she saw that it was good for food. Good for food. Well, that's the lust of the flesh, lust of the body. She was hungry at the time. And even though she'd been told to leave that one alone, nevertheless, it looked mighty good. Also, it was said that it was pleasant to the eyes. It looks like something she would see in Kirkland, something that she just wanted to buy. You know, this is, it was a pleasant looking thing. And so that would be the lust of the eyes, the senses. Uh, she's taking in this thing, uh, good for food, it's pleasant to the eyes. And then all of a sudden the serpent came along and told her that if you'll eat this, you can be as wise as God. Well, what is that? That's pride. That selfishness. Just think, I could be as wise as God. I could control my own destiny. I could do what I wanted to do. So you have all three of them, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride, involved in that original sin. A little bit later on, we watch King David go through something similar uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 in his forbidden affair with Bathsheba. You remember uh, it says that he didn't go to work. He slept all day. Got up in the evening, his sex drive was an overdrive, and that would be what? That would be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the body. Uh, then the next thing it says is he gets a visual. He sees beautiful Bathsheba bathing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what his perspective was or how big of a telescope he had, but nevertheless, he has a visual here, and that would be what we call the lust of the eyes or the lust of the senses that's going on. And then, uh, of course, he knows that he's not supposed to be doing that, but nevertheless, he thinks to himself, I'm king. I can do as I please, so I'll send some of my courtiers to go down and find out who this person is and have her brought to me. And that, of course, is pride. He's exercising his pride. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride. Now, what I want you to do, nobody talking out loud, but I want you to think about your last sin and which one of these desires tripped you up, which one of these lusts, whether it was gambling or gossip, addiction or adultery, cheating or cursing, what was it that tripped you? Was it the lust of the flesh? Lust of the eyes, the pride of life, some combination thereof. You know, that's, that's the way the temptation thing goes down. So, again, first point, temptation begins with our own lusts, our own desires. Second thing you need to know about temptation is temptation does not have to result in sin. Some people think it's automatic. Okay, I'm tempted, therefore I end up sinning. And that's the way that uh, we, we tend to look at it. It's often our attitude is that sin is inevitable. You hear people say, well, I'm only human. Nobody's perfect. God made me this way. God made the world. He made chocolate. He made me. It's fate. I'm supposed to be a chocoholic. You know, it just kind of one follows the other. We have no input in the outcome. We just go with it. Uh, insert your favorite sin into that line up there. And is it sex or alcohol or materialism or gluttony or greed or jealousy or laziness, anger, whatever it is? Uh, we tend to think that the, my favorite sin is just inevitable. It happens because I'm the way I am. But James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But we've got to blame somebody, don't we? We've got to blame somebody besides ourselves for our temptation and subsequent falling into sin. Uh, I remember watching a, one of those outdoor channel uh, videos, and uh, I saw this, uh, the game wardens had set up, you've seen these mechanical deers, these electronic deer that they have out there, and of course it's out of season, but uh, it's just a huge deer, and so this guy's driving along, you know, and they're watching him, they're filming him as he comes along, and he stops, and he sticks his weapon out the side, <laughs> and he ends up shooting the deer, and uh, of course they were trying to get a confession out of him, he said, no, I was entrapped, it's the game warden's fault for putting such a big rack on that deer, you know, so uh, again, it's never our fault, it's always somebody else's fault whenever we give in to temptation. Uh, some of you remember the old uh, comedian Flip Wilson, if you remember one of his punchlines, it was always that the devil made me do it, uh, but the Bible tells us the devil is a tempter, 
he is a liar, he is accuser of the brethren, he is the prince of the power of the air, but even, even the Bible tells you he don't make you do it. All he does is tempt you. He tempts you to do it, and of course he laughs at you after he gets you, but nevertheless, he doesn't force anybody to sin. John 1, 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth, it gives birth to sin. Now, again, nobody makes us do it. We sin whenever we cave in to temptation. I remember uh, when I uh, worked for a Gold Kiss Distribution Center back in the 80s, I uh, used to go back and have my morning coffee on the back dock with our trucking manager, and he was, a, he was really something, but I always enjoyed being around him. Uh, he was a full-time trucker, he was a part-time philosopher, and together, on the back dock, we used to solve all the world's problems. Well, one morning, uh, he was philosophizing on adultery. And he looked at me and he said, Danny, I know you're a deacon and I know you live a good Christian life, but you know what? Given the right time, the right place, and the right person, you too will fall in sin. And of course, the point he's trying to make is that sometimes adultery just happens. There ain't anything you can do about it. And so I let him finish making these points, and then I told him, I said, well, it seemed like to me it takes a considerable amount of planning in order to get that right time, right place, and right person together. Now, I said, I've known a number of people that got entrapped in adultery, but none of them was because they were on a shipwreck and, you know, two and a perfect other person washed up on the beach of an island somewhere. I said, normally... Normally, it's some phone calls, emails. That was back before text messaging. But anyhow, you know, you have, you have to kind of set this thing up. And all other sins are the same way. In Romans chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness or lust, not in strife or in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision. That is, make no plan uh, for the flesh or for your sinful nature. In other words, these things do not happen randomly. Uh, we do have a will. We do have choices. And we do have decisions that we can make. Now, another example, uh, why don't you turn forward to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and we'll see Peter's temptation in progress here. And we'll see how this thing works out as far as, uh, you know, it really ought to simplify it. Most, all, all sin occurs because of three things, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride. If you can just remember those three points, you ought to pretty well live a sinless life, right? <laughs> Problem is we don't remember it when we're in the middle of it, but nevertheless, here's poor Peter. Uh, Luke 22, verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. So here you got Jesus praying for Peter. He understands that uh, a time of testing and temptation is on the way for Peter, and he wants to pray for Peter to be faithful and to keep him from falling. And just think about this for a minute. If Jesus prayed about our temptation, don't you reckon we ought to pray about our temptations as well? So that, that's what, what, how it all begins here. But you look on down to verse 33, and no, Peter don't need that. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. What is that? Pride. Yeah, it's pride. I'm... I'm now, I don't know about the rest of these 11 people standing here, but you can count on me. When the going gets tough, you can count on old Peter. I'll be there with you, Lord, no matter what happens. And here's Peter and his pride. I can handle anything the devil throws at me. Look on down to verse 40 now. When Jesus came to the place, he had said to them, Now pray that you may not enter into temptation. So Jesus is telling them, Pray for help. Pray for strength to endure and to be able to overcome the temptations that's coming your way. Verse 45, when Jesus rose up from prayer, came over to check on his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And again, that's uh, a little pride working there. I don't need to pray. All I need is just a little nap. If I'm going to get my strength back, then I'll have all the strength that I need to prepare myself for this night that we're fixing to go through. But uh, see, uh, pride and, and uh, sorrow and exhaustion, though, is beginning to take its toll. So not only do we have this pride, I can do it myself, but you also have the lust of the flesh. How many of you ever get tired? How many of you are tired right now? I can see it in your eyes. But anyway, but anyway that's, that's just part of it. So these guys here, they're starting to wear out, and it's starting to take its toll on them. We get on down to verse 55. 
Uh, so they've already taken Jesus away at this point here. And now when they, talking about the crowd there, had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. So it's one of those early mornings. It's cold out there. So Peter, again, lust of the flesh. It's cold out here. Need to get near the fire. We all want to do that. So Peter went near the fire to get warm. However, once he gets to the fire, Peter began to hear the talk and see the mob and all of his senses began to build fear in him. Uh, lust of his senses, again, lust of the eyes. He began to see what was going on. He began to listen to the, the gossip that was going on around the campfire. He began to listen to them, began to accuse him and say, aren't you one of those? You have a Galilean accent. I think you were one of Jesus' followers and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, now the fingers are beginning to point at Peter. And of course, Satan is whispering to Peter saying, you need to save yourself. You better look out for number one. Uh, Jesus is not the Messiah. He's a loser. He can't even take care of himself. How's he supposed to take care of you? You better run for it, Peter. Get on down to verse 60. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know this guy. And immediately he was speaking and that rooster crowed. What did Jesus tell him about the rooster? He said, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. So all of a sudden he begins to put it all together. You got your temptation and it becomes a sin. What sin was it? It was lying and false witness, I don't know who Jesus is. Get on down to verse 62. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. The devil's already got him. So you got Peter here, the big fisherman. He's proud. He's confident. He's boastful. But now he's sifted like wheat. He's been reduced to a coward, defeated, feeling like a total failure. And what's Satan doing with all this and his demons? They're laughing and having a great time. They got another victory. Just had a knockout with his three punches, his three favorite punches. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride. And now you got Peter knocked out. You know, it didn't have to be that way. We always say, well, that's inevitable. If it happened to Peter, it could probably happen to us. Amen, it could. But it doesn't have to go that way. I'm sure Peter could still hear the words of Jesus. Pray that you do not enter into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Peter, that's how you're supposed to pray. And Peter didn't pray. He said, I think if I just get a nap, I'll feel better. If I can just get a couple of winks, and I'll be ready for this thing that's going to happen to me tomorrow. So number one, temptation begins with our own lust and desires. Number two, temptation does not have to result in sin. Number three, temptations are used by God to make us grow and mature. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but the world is full of temptations, both positive and negative. We look all around us, we see poverty and wealth, we see sickness and health. We see youth and aging. We see beauty and ugliness. We see adversity and prosperity on both ends of the spectrum. All those things are temptations for you and I uh, to turn away from the Lord and do things our own way. In order to remove these temptations from us, then we'd all have to die. Well, that's not God's will for us. John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus praying for us says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. Keep them from the evil one. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. So again, yes, we've got all these temptations going around, but the Lord has made it possible for us to be able to have victory over these things if we'll only trust in Him. And though we pray to avoid temptation, God allows us to pass through some of these temptations, some tempting situations in order to teach us, to test us, to prove us, and to strengthen us. Listen to what the Apostle Peter, after he's converted, after he knows what it means to fail miserably he writes in first peter chapter 1 verse 7 the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tried by fire may be found to the praise honor and glory at the revelation of jesus christ so what he's saying is the lord allows us to stay on this earth and as long as we're on this earth there will be temptations but you don't have to give in to them you don't have to be torn down by them because he i will offer you victory if you'll only put your trust in him now, generally speaking, we all agree in trial by fire. I think most of us know that uh, we require some hardship today in order to have victory tomorrow. That happens in virtually all areas of our life. We understand it. We may not like it, but we understand it. 
Uh, for example, we take our children to the doctor to get their shots and tests in order to try to build up their immune system against dreaded diseases. We send our children to school for teaching and testing and learning. Uh, we know that practice makes perfect for musicians. Uh, if you're ever going to learn to play an instrument like these folks over here that plays instruments for us, you have to practice, practice, practice. How many of you know that's the only way to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> So, so we know you got to go through all this in order to get good at what you do. In sports, we know that hard-fought games build champions. Uh, when I was in the military, I was told that sweat and training saves blood on the battlefield. In other words, they're going to put you through some really hard times to prepare you for the sad day that you might have to go to war. So all this, we understand that. But for some reason, we understand that in human realm, but we think evil of God when he puts us through. Uh, trials and tests designed to strengthen our faith. And you say, well, I don't feel like I got strengthened last time. It's probably because we failed it. If you ever win some of these temptations, if you ever win some of these tests, then it will build your faith. God the Father even put Jesus Christ, His beloved Son, through temptations when He was here on earth. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 that we looked at a few weeks ago, Jesus was taken, it says, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So again, God the Father allowing God the Son to go through the wilderness temptations. And the question is, is was his temptations any different than ours? Maybe he took it easy on his son and made it harder for us. No, he actually put him through the same things we go through. The devil used his same three favorite tools in order to test our Lord. First of all, there was a lust for flesh. Lust of the flesh. 40 days and nights without food. How many of y'all have <laughs> ever fasted for 40 days, 40 nights? 40 hours? Four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Only time we ever do that is when the doctor says, uh, I want a blood test with you, but with fasting. And so it's all we can do not to eat a bite before we go in and take that test in the morning. So we have no idea what it was like to live without food or drink. 40 days and 40 nights. That was Jesus enduring the lust of the flesh. Then there was the lust of the eyes. If you remember, the devil came along, picked him up, took him up to an exceeding high mountain, very high, so he could see all the kingdoms of this known world at the time. And he offered him all the popularity, the power, the prestige that tempts so many people today. People do anything for their 15 minutes of fame. If you don't believe it, watch some reality TV. It's amazing what people will do to get on TV for a few minutes. Uh, but anyway, the, all the, put Jesus through that as well. Showed him, said, you know, I know you see Rome over there. I can make you the Caesar. You can be king over everything in the known world at this time if you'll just bow down and worship me. And then finally, he tempted him with pride. He took him up uh, to the peak of the temple in Jerusalem and said, if you're really the Messiah, you need to prove it. Right now, you're just walking around like some kind of carpenter. What kind of deal is that? You need to go up on top of this temple. You're jump off, and when you land on your feet and you're in one piece, uh, then uh, everybody will know you're really something. You need to do something sensational, Jesus. You need to do something so you can be popular, so you can be famous, so that you can be chased around by the paparazzi. I dare you. I double-dog dare you to do that. And uh, what is he doing there? He's appealing to his pride. If you are who you claim to be, you need to prove it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he, Jesus, was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. All points? Jesus was tempted in all points just like we are? Yes. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride. You ain't got but three points you're tempted in. You say, well, mine's slightly different. Well, it may be slightly different, but still fall in the same category. So he was tested in all three points just as we are. Was his temptations easier than ours? No, they were actually harder because Satan is kind of like the interrogator in a POW camp. Have you ever seen those in the movies where we have ways of making you talk? You know, they take you in and they start off with just a little bit of, of in, interrogation technique or torture. And then, uh, you know, sometimes you don't last very long. Oh, I can't say anymore. And you start telling everything you know. But uh, if you sit there and say, no, I'm not going to tell you anything, then what happens? They increase the torture. And that's the way Jesus was. He never did give in, so the devil's cranking up the pressure on him. Most of us give in before Satan even gets warmed up, before he even really brings down the weight on us. We just go ahead and give it up. But Jesus endured temptation. Satan threw everything he had at him, and Jesus overcame the temptation. Remember that my sermon back there? How do you overcome it? By the word of God and prayer. 
He was in tune with his heavenly father. And if you remember, every time he told Satan to get thou behind me, he had a verse of scripture that went with it. He was prepared with the sword of the spirit which is the Word of God. And we can do that too. Each time we overcome our temptation, we go stronger and stronger in the Lord. And that's the purpose in God allowing us to go through those things is so that we grow stronger in Him. So, temptation begins with our lust and desires. Temptation does not have to result in sin, even though we seem to think it does. Temptations are used by God to help us to grow and mature. And then fourthly and finally, God wants you to have victory over your temptation. God wants you to have victory over your temptation. Yes, he puts you through these tests and then he rejoices and the angels in heaven do as well whenever you pass your test, whenever you stand up instead of falling down, whenever you uh, don't give in to the devil, uh, then the Lord gives you the victory. And of course, the way you gain this victory is by asking for the Lord's help. Sometimes it's as simple as that. We don't though. I can handle this one, God. I'll call you if I need you. Lead me not into temptation, but if I must... If this is the week, if this is the day that I must, then Lord, deliver me from the evil one. You say, but, but Danny, my last temptation was just too much. I, I had to give in. I couldn't help it. Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that everybody quotes and says, I ain't too sure about that one, preacher. No temptation has overcame you except what is common to man. In other words, the same temptations you've got, somebody else is probably going through with it on the other side of the world right now. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with that temptation make a way of escape so that you're able to bear it. That's New Testament. Guess what it also says in the Old Testament, Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all all what's the secret to victory well what jesus tells us in matthew 26 41 watch and pray lest you enter into temptation the spirit is indeed willing but the flesh our sinful nature is weak our carnal nature our sinful nature is weak so we must submit our spirit to the holy spirit of god if we're ever to win um, in this in this game of temptation Pray, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, Lord. But if I must, if I must go through something today, then deliver me from the evil one. Ask God to give you strength against the lusts of the flesh, to overcome your appetites, your bad habits, your pains, your immoral sexual desires, your exhaustion, your stress, whatever physical thing you're going through right now, whatever pain or suffering, whatever coronavirus or whatever else is out there. Part of, part of our, you know, uh, that's the temptation that uh, Satan tries to put us in. Ask God to give you faith to see beyond the lust of the eyes. Say, God, guard my senses. Help me guard my senses of what I see, what, what I hear, what I touch, what I taste, what I smell. Work through all these things, Lord, in order to give me victory. Also, you ask God to give you humility and wisdom to avoid pride. That pride in all of us that helps us say, I can do it myself. I'm in control. It's my life. I'll do it my way. That's what Peter was doing. And that's why Peter ended up failing. We've got to give that up. Ask the Lord to give us a spirit of humility. We've got to learn to pray or sing or however you want to do it. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. James 1.12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, in other words, you stood up to your temptation, you didn't give in to it, the Lord gives you victory, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see that? God wants to award you. God wants to reward you. And well, you know, it's almost invitation time. It's almost the end of the service time. And by the way, how many of you know that invitation time is also an hour of temptation? How many of you know the devil starts to work the crowd as Brother Danny moves toward the invitation time? Begins to give you all kind of thoughts going on there. But you know, at invitation time, there's always decisions that need to be made. There's always choices. There are always changes that need to be made. Some people need to repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and save you. Some of you may need to follow Jesus and believers baptism. You prayed to ask Christ to be your Savior, but you've never been baptized. You've never joined a church. You need to do that. Some of you need to surrender to his call to some kind of ministry. You know he's got it on your heart. You know he wants you to do it in these last days, and you need to get busy doing that. Also, some people need to ask God to help them break some bad habits, to turn away from some besetting sins. 
That happens every week when we have these times of invitation. But as you begin to consider these decisions, the evil one, the tempter, again, he can't make you do it, but he sure can tempt you to do it. He begins to whisper to you, and you know what he's using? His three favorite punches. He starts off with the lust of the flesh. Danny's preached to once again too long. You're tired. You're hungry. Why don't we put off thinking about this? You can always do it next week. That's the way he always does it. I'm not saying you don't need to make some change. I'm not saying you don't need to change a lot. I'm just saying you need to think about this. This is a very serious decision. Look at you. You're already tired. You're already hungry. You need to get out of here. Um, and then sometimes he'll work on the lust of the eyes. He'll tell you, look at all the people here. What will they think if you all of a sudden walked down with tears in your eyes, got down on your knees in front of the church here at the altar, what will they think you've been up to? This is going to be an embarrassing situation for you to be in if you actually respond to this invitation. Everybody will be whispering, I wonder what he did now. You know, something like, and all this is going on back there in your brain while you're trying to decide that you need to make some decision for Christ. And then finally, if none of the rest of it works, he'll put the pride to you, and that is look around you. You're as good as anybody in here, better than most of them. You don't have to walk out aisle. You don't have to make a decision. You don't have to go over and make a fool out of yourself. Just wait a few more minutes. The song ain't going to run that long. Danny will look up at Derek, and Derek will quit playing. You know the deal. <laughs> and then guess what? You're going to find yourself out there in the car, and the devil's going to be laughing at you because he got you again. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride. He wraps it up just like that. He said, wait a minute, you mean I actually sinned in church? Yes, you can sin in church. You can be tempted, and you can sin in church. You don't have to be on, you know, French Quarter of New Orleans in order to sin. He can do those things anywhere, any location. He can get you out of the will of God. It doesn't have to be this way. It starts off with a prayer that we begin with. Lord, lead me not into temptation. But if I must, if I must be tested this day, then deliver me. Give me victory over the evil one because I'm praying in humility. I'm submitting myself to your kingdom, to your power, to your glory forever. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would not lead us into temptation during this hour. But if we must, I pray, Lord, that you would deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever. Lord, give us a spirit of humility, not the spirit of pride. And Lord, guide us through all the troubles and trials we face in life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is our time of invitation. Again, pay no attention <laughs> to the flesh. Pay no attention uh, to the uh, uh, spirit of the flesh that's talking to you right now that's starting to get these conversations going. Just listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he's telling you to respond in faith to Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted Christ your Savior, I'll be standing down front. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you about that. Maybe you've already prayed, but you never made that public profession of faith by being baptized and by joining the church. Come on down. I'd love to talk with you about that as well. Maybe the Lord's got a calling on your life you've never said yes to. Again, he's not going to show you the way until you say yes, Lord. So you need to do that today. Maybe, again, there's some habit or besetting sin that's going on in your life. It may have nothing to do with any of that. You may be praying for somebody else that you know in your circle of influence. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he guides us during this holy time of invitation. As we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation, won't you come? My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died.
Just so you know, I just nodded at Derek, which means the invitation is over. <laughs> However, if the Lord is speaking to your heart and there's a decision you need to make today, I'll be here for a while. Um, I'm usually here till the last folks leave, so uh, don't leave today and get out to your car and say, well, the devil beat me one more time. Uh, let's talk about it. Let's pray about it, okay? God bless you. Thank you for being here today, for your attention, for your prayers. We ask Brother Charles, if you will, dismiss us in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to your house again to worship and honor your name. We thank you, Father, that you've given us in your word the roadmap for our lives and how to live them successfully for your honor and glory. And I pray that we will take that map, that we will chart out the course that you have for us, Father, that you will lead us, Father, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Father. We thank you that we can stand firm on your word and I pray that we'll do that this week, that we'll stand against the wiles of the devil, Father, and that we will see victory in our lives, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.